Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Monday, January 24th edition of the Basement Academy. Our morning psalm has some wonderful language in it. I think it's going to be a little familiar to you, Psalm 84. I love this notion of those who've set their hearts on pilgrimage, this journeying, the picture, of course, of Israel journeying up, making pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but I think that can stand more broadly as a metaphor for us making our pilgrimage home uh, towards God and the heavenly city. It implies steady growth and progress, and I think that's what we've been trying to talk about here in our reflections on character formation. So let's begin with Psalm 84. This is one of the Psalms of Korah. They are the worship leaders, uh, kind of the choir directors in uh, Israel. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer as we begin another week of journeying together on our pilgrimage. Amen. Okay. First week of reflecting on cultivating the character was this notion that that is God's purpose for our lives. Those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28, he's working all things for a good end. He's shaping us into the very likeness of his son. And so began with that notion, our flesh, the physical reality, but then the spiritual reality, we, uh, Paul speaks of the flesh as the kind of that indwelling sin principle, the autonomy, which we have, you know, kind of told God, thanks, we'll do it our own way. I'll do it my way. It expresses itself in action. And so, so the, our physical bodies and and minds and whatnot uh, are the means by which we express our autonomy over and against God. And so this must be harnessed. We must shape. We are malleable. We are dust of the earth with some water mixed in. We are clay and God is shaping us. And so through the Holy Spirit, we're being reshaped towards a chief end. Okay, so the chief end of man Uh, the Westminster Catechism, glorifying God, enjoying him forever. So this idea of living towards a goal and and, and a purpose and an an aim uh, in life. And so what I want to present, begin to present this week, probably will spill a little bit into next week as well, I think, will be a framework for thinking about character formation. That is how to actively participate in the formation of our character, that we are not merely passive lumps of clay, but God has endowed us with moral agency. We have reason and and will and, and emotion and passion and physicality. And so how do we cooperate, co-operate, okay? 
Uh, let me read one scripture, Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, a little parenthetic. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Friends, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's our responsibility to engage and to act and to think and with intent to participate in this, to live into this holy calling. We talked about this yesterday in church, Ephesians 4. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So Paul emphasizes our responsibility. But then he goes on and said, For it is God who is at work within you to, uh, how does it say, to, to will and to act according to his good purpose. And so there is a co-operation. God is operating. God is at work in us through the power of his spirit, shaping us towards an end. We are to co-operate we have a will. Let us will the things that are willed for us. Let us choose the things that are chosen for us. And so it's this notion of working together with God. And so there's a framework, very simply, so that you can kind of remember the three components, head, heart, hand. Okay? It's a way of thinking about participation that we can engage in in a thoughtful, structured, intentional way so as to work with the Spirit of God who is working towards the good purpose of conforming us to the likeness of Christ. And so head would refer to our thought life, how we think that this great gift of reason and rationality and cognition, we can hear and understand, we can read, and, and, and we take it in, we observe the world, all of that. And so we've already talked about Romans 12 too. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So head stands for uh, kind of the way we think, how we think, what we think. It has to do with truth and error. Not everything that we come to think is true is necessarily true. Okay, we do believe lies, and then as we engage with the truth of God's word, as we discern under the power of the Holy Spirit, we can discern truth from error, and we tease these things out. And if you know the truth, the truth will set you free, Jesus says. And so we pursue truth. The primary way we do that is through our scriptures, and so we need to know the Word of God. These scriptures can be known. <laughs> uh, you have an old covenant, a new covenant. They're set in historical, cultural, linguistic settings. And so often I'll be referring to the context. When I'm preaching like in Ephesians, you've got this Jew-Gentile context that, that gives depth and meaning and understanding. So we need to know our Bibles. Read through your Bible. Not all parts of it are as easy as other parts. Get a good Bible commentary. There's ways that you can, if you will, again, it's a choice that you make, to set time aside each day to read these scriptures and to understand. I'd be more than happy to talk with you at any point about some passage of scripture that is hard to understand. It's probably hard for me to understand too. And we can work at it together. But then the Bible are like the individual trees, right? We read a Bible story, a Bible story, a Bible story, a Bible story. These are the trees, but we need to develop a theological framework that helps to see the forest and the trees, right? And so you've got all of these stories, but how do you organize the stories? Well, that's theology, okay? Did a theology series uh, last year. Uh, and so always refer you back to that uh, for the 400 level. There's more to talk than that, but that was a basic theology series. But then our, our scriptures, as we uh, over time develop a kind of a framework for thinking about God and the world, and then we need to interact with our culture. We need to be able to 
actively engage and think our way through the issues of the day. So our study on critical race theory would be an example of that, where I'm trying to take scriptural, um, uh, biblical witness with a theological understanding and then engage with a cultural reality and work towards that. And then a goal is wisdom that we can discern and, and understand what to think and to say and to do, how to act um, in, in the midst of a, a challenging situation. So all of that and more uh, refers to when I say the head, okay? So we have work to do, reading, studying, thinking, thinking, reflecting, questioning, wrestling, all of this. That's part of character formation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then the heart. The heart refers to the inner affections and attitudes and dispositions and postures and appetites, not just the physical appetites for food. There's that. But often our appetite for food is driven by something else. We, we feel a little nudgy and so and so we go to the refrigerator and go get a you know a bowl of cereal or something for what purpose I, i've had my nutrition for the day and so we sometimes eat to quench something else that's stirring and churning inside and so heart refers to the the inner life the emotional life the life of our desires our wants, our longings, um, the places where we hurt, our sadness and our sorrow and where we feel we've been offended. All of those things, I'm talking about the heart. And I think that intersects with the head too, okay? So I don't want to, you know, uh, chop us up too too small here. But, but I think you know what I mean. The heart representing that emotional life, uh, the life where our, our will, our choices are made that are often driven out of emotional distress or anxiety or frustration or longing. Um, you know, addiction kind of plays in there. Um, and, and so, um, so probably all of us wrestle with some addiction at, at some level. We think we can't live without and then fill in the blank. I kind of think of golf that way from time to time. I think about golf a lot. Um, and so the heart has to do with all of this. And so uh, I don't know if you can see these words on the whiteboard. If you're listening, then you won't, obviously won't see them. Virtue and vice. Old timey words. Virtue and vice. Uh, a monk of many years ago, Thomas Akempis, uh, wrote about um, our hearts being like a garden and we need to plant virtue and uproot vice. And so virtue, like the Beatitudes, okay, these uh, meekness and gentleness and purity of heart and hungering and thirsting for righteousness and the like. Uh, Paul gives us a list of virtues in, Ro uh, I'm sorry, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, as we studied yesterday in church. Be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. These are virtues. And so we'll talk about that in these coming days. So we need to plant virtue. We need to be thoughtful about these qualities. But vice, I'm gonna, gonna, we're going to go through a little study on the seven deadly sins. Can you name the seven deadly sins? I'm going to give you a, a, a kind of an acronym, a, 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 a way of thinking about that to remember it, a, a memory device so that you can remember the seven deadlies. And so we need to be pursuing virtue and and turning aside from vice and recognizing it, okay? So virtue and vice has to do with our heart. And then coupled with this or tying in would be the fruit of the spirit. These nine character qualities or virtues, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This, can you imagine if our lives were full of these fruits and abounding. <laughs> wow, 
how different our lives would be. And so God wants this for us. He wills this for us. So let us work out our salvation to, because God is working in us to will and act according to this good purpose. So let us cooperate with the Spirit in bringing forth these, uh, these fruit. So anyway, head, heart, and then hand represents kind of the, the things we do, the, the, the phys, some of the physical realities, how we engage our bodies. And so we're going to talk about habits, patterns of behavior, actions that we engage in. Now, some of that we'll talk back here also, we're talking about vice and virtue. But there are these things called spiritual disciplines. Studying the Bible is a spiritual discipline. So in the same way an athlete engages in a certain disciplined exercises and drills according to their particular sport or um, a musician, play, you know, the, I'm thinking of the pianist who learns their scales and there's, there's physical training of the fingers and kind of eye-hand coordination and everything that's going on in that. And so every field of endeavor has some discipline, some um, body of knowledge or a skill that you must... Um, you must submit yourself to in order to master that. And so the Christian life has skills and actions to engage in. So the spiritual disciplines of study, of worship, of giving. So physically giving or giving of our money. Um, fasting. We'll talk about that and we'll be thoughtful about that, particularly as we get older. Fasting can be trickier. Um, silence, the discipline of silence, to spend time without the television on, not in front of a computer, not listening to songs, not reading a book, sitting in silence. Solitude would be a separate discipline to practice not always just being with, but learning how to be alone and to be alone with God. So silence and solitude often go together. So we're going to go whole, do a whole study on that, okay? Uh, and then stewardship, that is taking the physical energy, the time, the material possessions, the energy that God has given us to recognize God has entrusted my body and my life and these resources to me and how will I then live back in, in response, uh, a grateful response to God's love? So a life of stewardship and service, okay? Learning to serve others. And so all of this I, I use under the kind of rubric or, or image or metaphor of the hand. So head, heart, hand. So that's kind of the takeaway from today that there is a framework. We can think about cultivating the character of Christ there's things with our thought life, with our emotional, interior, spiritual life, and then the way we engage ourselves and spend our time and what we give ourselves to. And we will, there will be positive aspects of this where we focus on things to do, and then there will be kind of negative aspects, things we need to stop doing. And both of those will require significant effort okay significant effort but God's grace is poured out remember that Ephesians 3 prayer we studied just a week ago I pray that out of his glorious his rich, out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being that's why we want to pray that prayer daily God come strengthen me with power through your spirit and my inner being to enable me to engage in this walk of life following Jesus Christ and being conformed to his image. So let's close there as we're off into this new week. Uh, let us pray together. Father, hear our prayer for one another and for ourselves that we might indeed come to have the mind of Christ, that we might uproot the vice and plant the virtue, that we might engage and lean into these habits of godliness and Christ-likeness. 
And so shape us, uh, head and heart and hand, that we might be more and more conformed in the image of your dear Son, in whose name we pray, even as he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, may God continue to shape you. Uh, as the great uh, potter shapes the clay. May he shape you for his good and noble purposes this day and forevermore. Amen.